I'm checking in on the European Individual Championship and this splendid performance, splendid strategic game caught my attention. So it's round seven and Daniel Yufa playing white, he represents Spain, he's originally from Russia, and his opponent is Eri Kilik, from, who's a teenager from Turkey. So here we go, Yufa with white. And this game follows a very well-worn theoretical line. I say theoretical, there have been past games with this line. That's the thing with the Grunfeld. I remember playing the Grunfeld, you know, as a teenager. And it was great fun when both players were kind of improvising because, you know, black has counter chances against white center and yeah it's uh, it, it's double edged it's dynamic the problem is if your opponent knows lots of theory then it's it's not really that double edged actually it always felt like white could secure the center and then once white secures the center it's tough going for black so b6 has taken over at least amongst the top players, as the main line. Uh, in my day, everyone used to go queen c7 here. But, well, no doubt under the, under the influence of computers, b6 has grown into the main line nowadays. Queen d2, bishop b7, yeah, well, it's, it's a good spot for the bishop. Just uh, raking across the board here, whoops, misfire once again. Rook d1, so white has secured this d-pawn, but there's counterplay elsewhere. And e6, so this keeps this d-pawn sort of a little bit under control. Of course, white has the option to take this pawn, but it's rarely good because it just it leaves these pawns split and ugly. Even if white does win a pawn, uh, black always gets decent compensation. Bishop g5, so this is the main move here, and it starts to look at those dark squares around the king, and this is this is the issue for black. Queen d7, and now h4. So the idea is just to, to throw this one up the board. It might get to h6, it might take here. If I mean, black could block with h5, but it could leave g6 a little bit vulnerable. So knight a5 is the main move, hitting the bishop, and this bishop hits e4, so the bishop has to come back to d3. Now, black needs to relieve some of the pressure on the position. Uh, leave, I mean, get some counterplay, otherwise, you know, white is looking pretty good on the king side. So an exchange of pawns on d4 as an exchange of rooks. And here, well, I, I saw that there was a game that Wesley So played with black against Caruana, and he played rook c8, continuing chopping off the rooks, but Caruana managed to win that one. I, I think it's quite telling when someone as theoretically um, well-versed as Caruana is playing this as white and defeating Wesley So, then this line is definitely worth considering uh, with white. But instead of rook c8, knight c6 was played, also been seen before. So black puts pressure on that pawn on d4, and white has to deal with that, bishop b5. And black is able to grab that bishop. So you could say that that's something of a success and here for here Daniel Yufa thought for 42 minutes well it's a classical game of chess you're allowed to do that um, I think it's quite interesting that he thought for so long and you know this is quite a, a sort of crossroads in the game because White has to decide what to do about that pawn. Do you block like this, or do you push on? Well, he decided 
to play e5, and of course that's a move that has considerable consequences because it opens up this diagonal. But on the plus side, it starts to claim some more control over f6. Now, I mean, the reason I'm surprised that he thought for so long is because actually this position has been seen on more than one occasion. Here, the Austrian uh, top player, Marcus Rager, played rook c8, and actually he found a nice defensive idea. He just dipped back with that bishop, so the bishop still controls these dark squares, so the queen can't come in. And actually, he was okay here. And, well, the, the players actually agreed to draw in this position. I mean, I, I would still prefer white here, but seems okay. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, Katarina Lagno was more concerned about the bishop coming to f6, so she played f6. But this is certainly better for white. Queen e3, there, there is some pressure here. The king has opened up a bit. You never know when h5 is going to come to open things up again. That's a comfortable position for white. When I say comfortable, it feels a lot easier for white to play than black. And that rook is looking great on the open file. So what did uh, Killick do here? Well, he played bishop b5. That one loses time because after knight g3, well, that knight is going to hop back into the middle. That looks really dangerous. Killick just put the bishop back on c6, so he's lost time. And the bishop comes in. Yeah, it might be very nice if white could exchange here and get this pawn up the board. h6. So that plugs a few of the dark squares, and Eufa exchanged and then played h5. Now, in an ideal world, one would wish to play g5 to keep things closed, but that knight could hop round via e3 to g4 to f6. That's quite a nice square. Um, looking at d5, and yeah, don't know, feels uncomfortable to me. So bishop d5 was played. The knight came back anyway. That looks like an excellent square, e3. And yeah, if g takes h5, that feels very risky. Feels like the the king is is opening up. So rook c8. Rook's exchanged. H takes, f takes. Now that opens up the seventh rank. It's interesting, if you feed this into a computer, then uh, it will tell you that the position is equal. Now that's, that I find that really interesting. Because from a human point of view, I look at this position and I think, well, white obviously has pressure in this position. So the queen is on the open C file. You can see black's king is exposed along the seventh rank. I mean, you can see, just compare the two kings, which king is safer? Obviously, white's king has nice cover. Black's king does not have such great cover once the f pawn has gone. Okay, which side has the better minor piece? Well, I think that knight on e3 looks pretty good, menacing the bishop. That bishop, if there were more pieces on the board, it might be very good. But alone, well, it's just hitting here. I mean, white can always play f3 to block the diagonal anyway. So the knight is, a, I think, a superior minor piece to the bishop. The queen, as I said, is on an open c file. The king is a little bit insecure. All in all, it seems to me that you know white has pressure here. Now, what is the computer assessment of equality based on? Well, it's based on the fact that, I'm guessing, if black defends absolutely correctly for the next, I don't know how many moves, then it should be a draw. But that's really tough. Black is under pressure. Let's see how things went. And yeah, I, sh I should also mention that, well, actually, there are quite a few weak points to attack in black's position. Whereas for white, 
Actually, not so many. I mean, you could say that the, the deep horn needs protection. Yeah, fine. But there are more weak points in black's position than in white's. Do you see what I mean here? It's quite, it's quite, it's quite unpleasant. You know, black has to decide which pawn do you push. Do you push here? Do you push that one? A5 was played. And black played king e7, and then the queen dipped back to c2. Ooh, that's a little bit uncomfortable. That pawn is under fire. With hindsight, probably king e7, not the best move. Probably a, an, another waiting move would have been better. But king e7 played queen c2, that's unpleasant. If king f7, watch this, knight c4, and the knight gets to d6. Nasty stuff. So black took on d4, white checked, obviously black has to protect with the queen otherwise the bishop drops and queen takes pawn. So there's been a little, little transaction there, little exchange. This pawn is a little vulnerable. Uh, the bishop is also vulnerable, that needs protection. It doesn't really have a good safe square on d5 because it's in the, in the sights of the knight. So that's two weak points. And don't forget these, and the king is a bit exposed. So uh, just feels like white is making progress here. Queen b1, attacking that pawn on g6, king f7. The knight hops in. So that's a definite achievement once the knight reaches d6 because it's getting closer to black's king and it starts to dominate the king as well. Uh, excuse me, the queen as well. Knight d6. Bishop c6 and queen c1. Mmm, those weak dark squares. That uh, was really the plan that you know, what, way back here, white started to uh, massage black on these dark squares way back with bishop g5 and then h4. And now, back here, queen g5, it's coming good. These dark squares are weak. King h7. So black is holding on. Now, here's... Finally, the moment when it's time for you to have a little think and for me to have another drink of my tea. So, white to play. Time to think of a strategy. Black is just about holding firm here. It's not a pleasant position for black at all. But how does white make progress here? This is the question. Cheers, folks. You have a little think. White to play. King h2. I hope those weak dark squares reminded you of something. Let's see what happens. Queen a7, queen f4, just protecting the pawn, keeping everything under control. Black's queen can't wander too far away because, of course, the queen and knight will come in for a deadly attack. So queen d7, black is really quite passive. Queen g7. F4. So this is very nice for white. Basically, if black can't exchange queens, then black is in massive trouble. So let's just have a quick look. Takes, takes. You can see the king can't approach the pawn. Those squares are covered. And yeah, this this should be a lost endgame, basically. The, the king needs to approach, but it should be losing. So queen d7 played, the knight hops in, g3, just making sure everything is protected. Remember, if the queen moves away, then there'll be a catastrophe. So black has to wait, and now here we go. The time is right 
for the king to enter the position. Okay, watch out, that one can be taken. So there's, there's a bit of dancing around here while White sort of sorted out what he was going to do. King g5, yeah, it's getting closer. And here we go again. Ah, there we go, knight d8. Attacking e6, bishop f5, king h6. There we go. That's the, the high point of White's strategy. The king helps out with the mating attack. Queen g7 mate is threatened. And I'm sure you're reminded of a famous game between Nigel Short and Jan Tim, and I'll show you that in a second, or at the end of it anyway, where something similar happened, but in a middle game. Really spectacular. So what did Black play? Queen d7 to stop the mate. And now one final move. Knight c6, and here Black resigned. Well, there's still a bit of a way to go, actually, in this game. It is hopeless. So let me take you through what could occur here. So first of all, queen takes knight, allows queen g7. And knight e7 is threatened. Therefore, queen h7 check. The king must come back. Knight e7 is still a threat. Let's say queen g7. Knight e7 check. And this can be taken. So this transposes into a winning king and pawn endgame. Now e takes f5 is the easy one because the king just gets distracted. The king has to come back and then this one goes. Now g takes f5 is also pretty easy because white is just a pawn up and actually nice simplification. And now the king, all the king needs to do is just come around here. It doesn't matter whether the king steps in, it'll be the same basically. Um, but let's let's just check this one out. King f7. And the king comes in and king b5. And if the king Yeah, well, there's there's just nothing to do basically. King b5. This one drops, and obviously two extra pawns, very easy win. Well, I like that a lot. I know it took a long time to get there, but um, I do love that kind of king march to help out. Um, and yeah, a word of warning about computer assessments. As I said, in this position way back here, my computer software says it's equal. But that's only if black plays precisely for the next 50 moves because white can play on and on in this position and wait for the moment that black cracks and little by little make progress that's the problem now let me show you just a quick reminder of that short timon finish which was more spectacular because it was actually in a middle game so short Timon, Tilburg 91, I'm sure you've seen it before. The king advanced all the way to h6. Well done, Nigel. Great stuff. Bishop takes king h6. That really was checkmate. Glorious stuff. Um, I, I'm going to show you just very quickly a little postscript. Um, I've always liked this game, actually. This is Yunovsky Saburov from Ostend 1906. You can see that uh, white has a beautiful grip on the position. The queen can't take the pawn on h6 because f7 is hanging. So how did white make progress here? Yeah, you know it. The king advanced up the board. Well, obviously it can't go to h6. However, this is pretty good. Black can't do much because the rook can't leave the back rank. Rook b8 and now queen e7. Nice transposition to a winning rook and pawn endgame. King f8, king here, and rook f7. That was the final move of the game. So I like that one. That's that's really nice. And dare I say it, I've Got an example from one of my own games. I have actually shown this game on the channel previously. 
it is uh, I enjoyed this let me, let me show you this one again not quite as spectacular but it's not a middle game it's uh, it's a queen end game but this was uh, a game played in Switzerland in 2000 I was I was had white against Andrei Sokolov I've shown this on the channel already so I'll put the link to the whole game the whole the whole video so I managed to get my king up the board and this finish was well how can I say I really enjoyed this threatening queen here I love the symmetry and this position is Zugzwang wherever black moves it compromises the position and that's the end uh, my opponent played a6 a3 and boom he had to compromise and then I came in obviously if the queens are exchanged the end game is winning and again beautiful symmetry <laughs> I broke the symmetry with King, e, King G7, and here my opponent resigned because this one is about to drop. Anyway, I'll, um, as I said, I've, I've actually looked at this game in another video, so I'll put the link to that um, in the comments if you want to have a look at that one. But yeah, I thought I really enjoyed um, this manoeuvre. Fantastic stuff by Daniel Ufa. I should say that um, actually he's mid-pack. He has four and a half out of seven, which is a decent score, but uh, no one, not really nowhere near the lead. Um, in the lead, we have Anton Korobov with six and a half out of seven. He's playing incredibly well. Won a tough game in round seven, and he faces Benjamin Gledura from Hungary, who has six points. So six and a half for Korobov, Gledura, six points, and then there's a pack of players on five and a half. I will be reporting back to let you know what happens in the final four rounds of the European Individual Championship. Thanks for watching.